Welcome to the video lecture on solving non-linear equations. Many applications in mathematics give rise to sets of equations with several variables rather than just a single equation with a single variable. A set of equations with a set of common variables is called a system of equations. You should by now already have learned how to solve a simple system of linear equations. In this lecture we will briefly review what you have learned and learn how to solve a system of non-linear equations. So let's take the system 2x minus y equals to 7 and 4x plus 3y is equal to 19. This is called a 2 by 2 system because it has two variables, x and y, and two equations. Now the first method that we're going to review for how to solve this system is called substitution. So substitution requires in your first step to take one of your equations, whichever looks easier, and solve it for either x or y. Again, whichever is easier to do. So in my system here, I like this top equation and I think it would be fairly easy to solve for y. So we're going to solve for y first in this top equation. Now if we do that, that's going to take this equation here and I could add the y over to the other side and then I could subtract the 7 over to the left side so I get 2x minus 7 is equal to y and I'm gonna put a box around that because in the substitution method we always come back to this equation right here so that we can find our other variable that we're trying to solve for. So we've solved for y and now what we're going to do is the actual substitution. So we are going to substitute this expression in for y into the other equation. So we are going to take our second equation here, 4x plus 3y equals 19, and wherever I see y, I'm going to replace it with this 2x minus 7, wrapped in parentheses. So this second equation becomes 4x plus 3y, and instead of y, I'm going to put in its place 2x minus 7. And all of that equals 19. <clears throat> now after you've done that, you should now have a linear equation with only one variable involved, namely x. So all we have to do now is solve for x. So I'm going to want to distribute, so I'll get 4x plus 6x minus 21 equals 19. Combine like terms, then I'm going to add the 21 over to the other side, and that will give me 40. And if I divide through by 10, I get that x is equal to 4. Now that we know what x is, we still need to figure out what y is because remember this was a system that had two variables so you need to find both variables for your final answer. So we're going to substitute x equals 4 back in up here. So that's the easiest place to go because once we substitute 4 in for x right here, it will immediately tell us what y is. You could also have substituted it in back into any of the original equations that you started with as well, but this is the most direct approach. So if I substitute in 4, then we get 2 times 4 is 8, 8 minus 7 is 1, so y is equal to 1. Now when we write our solutions, typically for a 2 by 2 system like this, we write our answer as an ordered pair with x coming first and y coming second. So our solution would be the ordered pair 4 comma 1. Okay, now we're going to do this same exact system, let me recopy it, but this time we're going to do it using what's called the elimination method, or sometimes it's called the addition method. And the idea behind the elimination method is to get the coefficients in front of either the x's or the y's to be the same exact number but opposite signs. So we're trying to get the coefficients of x or y to be opposites. And then once we get that to happen, then we add the two equations together. So when you decide which variable you want to make the coefficients be opposites of, just use, again, whatever looks easiest. 
you could easily make this 2 become a minus 4 by multiplying the entire top equation by a negative 2, or you could make this coefficient in front of this y be a negative 3 by multiplying this entire equation by 3. Both solutions are fine, and they require the same amount of work. So let's say that we wanted to get rid of our x's first and eliminate the x's. So what I could do is take this entire top equation and I'm going to multiply it through by a negative 2 and that will take this 2x and turn it into a minus 4x. Now you have to multiply the entire equation by negative 2 otherwise you're not keeping the equation balanced and you're going to be changing your solution. So the solution that you get won't be the same as the solution of the original problem. So make sure you multiply the entire equation across. That's going to make this become a positive 2y and a negative 14. Now we're not going to do anything to that second equation. I'm just going to recopy it. And now that these x's are the same but opposites, I'm going to add down. And that should make these x terms eliminate. 2y plus 3y is 5y, and negative 14 plus 19 is 5. That's a real simple equation then to solve for y. Just divide by 5, and we get y is 1. Once we figure out what y is, then we're just going to have to substitute it back in to one of our original equations. And you really could substitute it into any four of these equations. I usually like to go back to the one that looks simplest for y or simplest for x, since that's what we're trying to solve for. So in this case, they all have coefficients in front of x's, so I don't think it's really going to matter where we plug it into. I'm just going to go ahead and take this top equation, because it looks the easiest to me. And now that we know what y is, we're going to substitute in a 1 for that y, and solve for x. So if I add 1, I get 2x is equal to 8, divide by 2, and we get x equals to 4. So same solution that we had before, now we have 4 comma 1. Okay, So elimination method works really well, especially if your system is already lined up with your x's, your y's, and your constants in order. And you just try to make the coefficients be opposites. The last method that we're going to review is the graphical method. So if I take a look at my two equations again. This method is exactly what its name implies. We're going to graph each of these two equations simultaneously on the same grid, and what we're looking for is where these two lines will cross. The intersection point of these two lines is going to be our solution. So our process here is to graph both equations, and then your solution will be the intersection point. Where do they both cross at the same time? So let's go ahead and start with this first equation, 2x minus y is equal to 7. You can graph it in many, many different ways. If I were to solve this for y, remember we did that earlier, we could subtract the 7 over to the left and add the y over to the right. So this is just the line of the form 2x minus 7 equals y. That's in slope-intercept form. So I know that my b, my y-intercept, is at negative 7. Put a dot. And then my slope is 2, or 2 over 1. So I can go from that b, go up 2 and over 1. Up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1, and so forth. And then you want to graph your line as carefully as you can. So here's my first line. Then we take a look at the second equation. And this one, you can do the same thing if you like. You can divide through, or excuse me, you can solve for y first by subtracting that 4x over to the right side and then dividing through by 3. So y is equal to negative 4 thirds x plus 19 thirds. Another option is you could do zeros. You could let x be 0, and then that would force y to be 19 thirds. Or you could let x, excuse me, y be 0 and solve for x, and that would force x to be 19 fourths. So it's totally up to you how you want to do that. 
Now, personally, I like to find zeros quite often because I think that's a pretty easy way to go. Unfortunately, for this particular problem, these zeros don't turn out to be very nice numbers. They're fractions. So you can approximate what these values are. 19 thirds, 3 goes into 19 about 6 times. So this is 6.3 repeating. 4 goes into 19 4 times. And this is 4 and 3 quarters, or 4.75. However you want to write that. So if we approximate here, when x is 0, the y is supposed to be 6.3 repeating. So we have to estimate that. And then x is 4 and 3 quarters when y is 0. So you get an x-intercept and a y-intercept. And then connect the line, connect the dots between those two intercepts. And what we're looking for is our intersection point. Now here you can hopefully see what the downfall is to this graphing problem. Because it's so difficult to graph decimals, for example, and it's so easy to have slightly um, crooked lines when you're graphing, it's easy to have some inaccuracy in your graphs. So it's not the best method for getting an accurate solution, especially if the solution is not nice integer values. This one, to me, looks like it's at 4, 1, which we already know is the solution. So I was able to graph fairly consistently here to be able to get the same solution that we already got algebraically using elimination and substitution. But the one big downfall that I think exists for the graphical method is that it's not very accurate. However, it is very visual. So you can kind of picture in your head and on this graph exactly what's going on here. We're trying to find where these two lines have the same x and same y at the same time. And that's this point 4, 1. OK? Now what we're going to do, since we've now reviewed how to solve simple linear equations, is we're now going to try to use some of those same strategies to solve nonlinear equations. So these would be equations that are not going to have graphs that are lines necessarily. So if you take a look at this first system right here, we have some squares going on, which means these are going to be quadratic functions if you were to graph them. So we have 3x squared plus 4y equals to negative 4, 2x squared plus 5y equals to negative 12. Now you could certainly graph these and try to figure out the solution graphically, but I want to show you some algebraic techniques here because, again, these algebraic techniques find your solutions very accurately and they get exact values, whereas a graphical solution on your calculator may be able only to find you an approximation. So if possible, you want to try to do these algebraically. So let's go ahead and see how we could do this. Now, if we look at the system, the x squared terms are nicely lined up, the y terms are nicely lined up, and the numbers are nicely lined up. So this is ideal for that elimination technique. Because those x squareds um, have higher powers, they are a little bit more difficult to deal with. However, you could hopefully see here how to make these coefficients in front of those x squareds become opposites. You could also do this for the y's if you prefer to eliminate the y's first. I'm going to go ahead and try to make these x squared terms have opposite coefficients, and I'm going to figure that out by just sort of thinking what a common denominator kind of might be. And in this case, if you've got a 3 and a 2, you'd probably think 6. So what would I have to multiply 3 by to get 6? I would need 2, and down here I would need to multiply by 3. Now the other thing to consider is we want them to both be 6's, but we also want them to be opposites. So let's just make this bottom one be negative, and it doesn't matter which one you decide, so that they have opposite signs. So this top equation becomes 6x squared plus 8y equals negative 8, and the bottom equation becomes negative 6x squared minus 15y equals positive 36. Now that those x squareds are um, the same coefficients but opposite signs, we can go ahead and add down and they should cancel right out. Negative 15 plus an 8 is a negative 7y, and 36 minus 8 is negative 28. 
So now when I go and I try to solve this, we're going to be able to divide through, excuse me, this is a positive 28, not a negative. We're going to go ahead and divide through by negative 7, and that'll give us 28 divided by negative 7 is negative 4. So now we know what y is. You're not done until you also find x. So now what we're going to do, just like in our elimination method, is take this number, negative 4, and we're going to substitute it into either of these two equations. It doesn't matter which one. So let's just say I started with this top equation, and I now know what y is, so I'm going to substitute in negative 4 for this y. So that becomes 3x squared minus 16 equals negative 4. Add 16 over to the other side. Negative 4 plus 16 is 12. Divide by 3, and we get x squared is equal to 4. Now we want x, not x squared, so to finish solving for x, we need to take a square root. And don't forget, when you are the one taking the square root, you need a plus or a minus symbol. Square root of 4 reduces to 2. So we actually get two x values for this y value of negative 4. So the way that you could write out your solution is when x is positive 2, y is negative 4, or if x is negative 2, y is negative 4. So both of those are our solution points. So these two parabolas, if we were to graph them, must intersect at these two points. Okay, let's take a look at the next example here. So here on the top equation, we have 2x squared plus 4y is equal to 13. That's another parabola. And then we have x squared minus y squared is equal to 7 halves. And that's not a parabola. It's going to be a hyperbola. And you could graph these if you want, but because of those x squareds and y squareds, especially in that bottom equation, it makes it a little bit tricky to try to type it into your um, calculator because this is not a function. So I'm going to try and avoid the calculator altogether and try to do this using that elimination technique again. I have my two x squared terms nicely lined up. Please note over here that this is a y, but this is a y squared. So these are not technically like terms. And then we have our constants over here. So the only terms that match are the x squared. So if I could get those to eliminate, then that might get me somewhere. So let's take this second equation and make it have the opposite coefficient of the top equation. So let's multiply through by a negative 2. So I'm not changing this top equation at all. I'm not doing anything to that. But the bottom equation becomes minus 2x squared plus 2y squared. And when I multiply by um, negative 2, the 2's cancel with that 7 halves. So I'm just going to be left with a negative 7. Now when I add down, the x squared terms do cancel, but be careful here. These are not like terms, so don't be tempted to get a 6 in front here. You can't really add these together, so I just have to copy them both. So I've got a 2y squared, plus I have a 4y. Those are not like terms, so I'm just bringing them down. And 13 minus 7 is 6. Now this is just an option, you don't have to do this, but I happen to notice here that all of these numbers here are even. So we could divide every single term by 2 just to make our equation become a little bit simpler. So we're going to get a y squared plus a 2y is equal to 3. Now look at what kind of an equation this is. This is quadratic. It has that y squared in there. So what we would normally do to solve a quadratic is we would get a 0, so I'm going to subtract that 3 over to the left side. And if we're lucky, it will factor. And this one looks like it has good potential to factor. Now if it didn't factor, then we would probably pull out our quadratic formula. But I think we'll make this work here. We can have a y and a y to get y squared, a 3 and a 1 to get a 3. If I make the 3 plus and the 1 minus, that will add to a positive 2. So this factor tells me that y could be negative 3. And this factor tells me that y could be positive 1. Now we're not done yet. We still need to figure out what x is. So let's go back to our system up here. And you can use either equation that you want. Because the second one has a fraction in it, I prefer to use the top equation. So I am going to rewrite up here my equation. 
and we had two solutions for y. So let's let y be the negative 3 first and see what we get for x. So if I substitute in a negative 3, 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. I'm going to add 12 to the other side, and that gives me 2x squared is equal to 25. Divide by 2, so x squared is 25 halves. And to finish solving for x, take a square root. Don't forget your plus or minus symbol. Square root of 25 reduces nicely to 5, but the square root of 2 stays put. If you want to rationalize your denominator, this would become 5 root 2 over 2. So some of our solutions we already know. We know that if x is positive 5 root 2 over 2, that happened when y, excuse me, when y was negative 3, or negative 5 root 2 over 2 for x when y was negative 3. Now we have to do the same process again, but this time we need to let y be 1. So now we're going to take y equal to 1 and plug it back into that top equation. So it gives me 2x squared plus 4 times 1 equals 13. So 2x squared plus 4 is 13. Subtract the 4. That gives me 9. Divide by 2. So x squared equals 9 halves. Take a square root of both sides, and I get x equals plus or minus 3 over root 2. Or if you rationalize, 3 root 2 over 2. So my other two solutions are either positive 3 root 2 over 2 for a y value of 1, or negative 3 root 2 over 2 for a y value of positive 1. So these four points are my intersection points. Okay, let's take a look at the next example. Here we have x minus y squared equals 0, and y minus x squared is equal to 0. Now on this one, I just want to show you graphically what this is going to look like because it's fairly simple to graph even without a calculator. If you take a look at this top equation here, and if I move that y squared over to the other side by adding it, this just becomes x equals y squared. Likewise, on the second equation, if I add that x squared over to the other side, this just becomes y equals x squared. So just visualize ahead of time what that's going to look like. x equals y squared is a sideways parabola. It's not a function because it won't pass the vertical line test because it's going to look like this. Sideways parabola with its vertex at the origin pointing to the right because it's a positive y squared. Similarly, y equals x squared is also a parabola, but this time it's upright. So it's going to look like our normal u-shape pointing up. So just looking at that graph, how many solutions would you predict there to be? We're looking for intersection points. So it looks like there's a solution right here at the origin, 0, 0, and also right here as well. So I would predict that there's going to be two answers that we get. Now how could we get them algebraically? How could we do this without using any graphs at all? Well, let's see some techniques here. On this one, we don't really want to use our elimination technique because I don't have any like terms. I don't have two x's that could cancel, or two y's that could cancel, and I don't have x squareds or y squareds that could cancel. Every one of these four terms is something different. So elimination is not going to work here. However, we can use substitution because this top one, very easy to solve for x, the bottom one, very easy to solve for y. So you choose which one you want to use and substitute it in. So say we just took this top one, we solved it for x. Now what we could do is use this expression y squared and replace the x that we see in this bottom equation with that y squared. And you could either do it down here or you could substitute it in to that original second equation. Either way works. So what I'm really doing is I'm keeping this y the same. But instead of using x right here, I know what x is supposed to be. It's supposed to be y squared. So I'm going to substitute in a y squared where that x was, but that whole x is supposed to get squared again. 
so it would look like this. y minus the quantity y squared squared, and that's supposed to equal zero. Now y squared squared, a power to a power, you multiply those powers. So this becomes y to the fourth. Now this is a fourth degree polynomial, so in order to solve this, we have to get a little bit lucky and hope that it will factor. And in fact, there is a GCF of a y that I could pull out. This would leave me with 1 minus y cubed. 1 minus y cubed is a difference of two cubes, so it will factor further. And this is one of those factoring formulas that you kind of want to have memorized because it's sort of difficult to come up with it on your own. The way that you factor two cubes is you take the cube root of each term in this first factor, so 1 and y, and if this is minus, that first factor stays minus. Then the second factor has three terms, and it comes from the 1 being squared, which is going to stay 1, the y being squared, which becomes y squared, and that's always positive, and the middle term is these two multiplied together, so 1 times y is y, with the opposite sign. So if this is minus, then I need a plus over here. And you can double check if you were to FOIL all of these terms back out, every single middle term would cancel except for the very first one, which is 1, and the very last one, which is that y cubed. So it does work. Okay, we're getting there. Now that it's factored, this last factor here does not factor any further, so we're left with just trying to set each factor to 0. So where does this y hit 0? At 0. So that's one answer. Where does this factor hit 0 when y is 1? And where does this quadratic factor hit 0? Well, that one's not so obvious, and because it doesn't factor, you would have to use quadratic formula probably to figure it out. So let's see what this would give us. The solution y would have to be minus b, which in this case is negative 1, plus or minus that b squared, 1 squared stays 1, minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is 1, all over 2 times a. And if we start simplifying here, under that radical, we're going to get 1 minus 4, which is negative 3. And that's a complex number, not a real number, and we're only finding solutions in the real number system on our graph. So this does not have a solution that is real. So that's not going to contribute any answers. So we don't have any solutions from here, we just have y being 0 and y being 1. So we're almost done. If y is 0, what does that mean about x? And you can go back to this box to figure out what your x is. According to this, x is supposed to be y squared, so if I substitute in 0, 0 squared is going to stay 0. So one of my solutions is that point at the origin, 0, 0, which is exactly what we predicted from our graph. And if we go to our other solution for y, y being 1, using that box again, x is supposed to be y squared, so if I substitute in 1, 1 squared stays 1, so that tells me that x is 1 when y is 1. So that means my two points would be 0, 0, which is right here, and 1, 1, which is right here. Okay? All right, the next one here. xy is equal to 24, and 2x squared minus y is equal to 10. So again, you could try to graph this if you like. Um, the bottom equation is going to be just a parabola. The top one is one of these rational functions that looks kind of like um, a hyperbola. So we're going to have to be a little bit careful here and maybe see if we can avoid graphing this since it's not so easy to do by hand. We're going to try to find an algebraic technique that will get us our graph um, or get us our solution more accurately than a graph might. So let's see what we could do. Now the first thing you might consider is that elimination technique, but that's not going to work here because I don't have two x squareds lined up or two y's. I've got a mixture of everything. Plus I have a product here of an x times a y. So elimination really isn't going to work for me. 
So the next strategy you probably want to consider then is substitution. Can I solve one of these equations fairly easily for either x or y? And you could certainly do that for the top equation, but it's going to give you some fractions. You'd have to divide by x or divide by y in order to solve for a variable. So I would recommend taking a look at the second equation instead, and that one's not too difficult to solve for y. I could just subtract the 10 over to the left and add the y over to the right. So that's what I'm going to do, and that way I'm avoiding fractions. Now that I know what y is, I'm going to substitute in for this y the expression 2x squared minus 10. So this top equation becomes x times y, and instead of y, I'm going to write 2x squared minus 10, and that has to equal 24. So let's go ahead and distribute our x. We get 2x cubed minus 10x is equal to 24. You don't have to do this if you don't want to, but again, I noticed that all of those coefficients are even, so if you want, you could divide everything by 2 to try and make your equation a little simpler. And we get x cubed minus 5x is equal to 12. And this is cubic, so I'm going to go ahead and set it equal to 0 by subtracting 12. And at this point, we would need to get a little bit lucky in order to finish solving algebraically. The only way we know how to solve cubics is if it factors somehow. And unfortunately, this doesn't fit into any of our factoring strategies. There's no common GCF that I could pull out. It's not going to factor using reverse FOIL because of that cube. And I don't have any other techniques like grouping that might work because I only have three terms. So at this point, we're kind of stuck algebraically. So then we would have to pull out the graphing calculator and proceed from there because we have no other techniques for figuring out the solutions to this other than just guessing and checking answers, which is never a good idea. So what we're going to do is pull out the calculator and try to graph this thing. So we're going to go to our y equals, and we're just going to type in our function, which was x cubed minus 5x minus 12. And I'm just going to start with a standard window because I'm not sure what this is going to look like. And remember what we're looking for here, we're looking for where this equals 0. So we're looking for zeros. Now you are predicting a cubic here and you can kind of see that little up and down shape down here. Just to verify you could extend your window a little bit. Um, we can make that at, or excuse me, that y min go a little bit lower, maybe to negative 20, just so we can see that full cubic shape and rest assured that we're seeing all the important pieces of our graph. So there's that nice cubic shape, so hopefully that convinces you that the only x-intercept we're going to have, the only zero we're going to have is right here. So how do I find it on my calculator? We use our calc command. So I'm going to do second trace to get to calc, and we are looking for a zero. So I'm going to go to option number two for zero, and I'm going to go all the way over to where that zero looks like it is, and for my left bound, just do one or two clicks to the left. I'm just going to do one click to the left, hit enter for my left bound, and then I'm going to arrow back to that zero and do one click to the right for my right bound, and then go back to that zero for my guess and it looks right on 3 comma 0, so right at x equals to 3. So let's go back and write that down. So that means here that x was 3. Now that we know what x is, we still need to find y. So we have to go back to our box and we're going to substitute in to 2x squared minus 10 equals to y the value of 3 for that x value. 3 squared is 9, 9 times 2 is 18, and 18 minus 10 is 8. So it looks like my solution here is going to be 3 comma 8. And remember, you should always be able to plug those back into both of these two original equations, and it should make them true. So that's one quick check that you can always do. 
Okay, let's take a look at the next system. Here we've got a big mess. You probably wouldn't want to graph these at all because you've got all these fractions. 4 over x squared plus 6 over y to the 4th equals 7 halves. 1 over x squared minus 2 over y to the 4th is equal to 0. So obviously um, you can work through various techniques here. It's up to you how you want to do this. Um, elimination actually could work here because you've got a 4 over x squared and a 1 over x squared. So if you made that 1 on top into a negative 4 by multiplying this whole bottom equation by negative 4, you could get those first two fractions to cancel out. And we may actually do that. You could also do that for the second terms over here. Make this equal to a 6 and get those to cancel out as well. So elimination is a viable technique. You could also try substitution by trying to solve one of these equations for x or for y, or some version of x or y. So let's see what we can do here. Um, I was inspired initially when I looked at this to do that elimination method because I've got fractions that are nicely lined up and with common terms. So let's go ahead and see if we can get these x's to cancel out. Let's multiply through by negative 4. I'm not doing anything to that top equation. And the bottom equation becomes minus 4 over x squared plus 8 over y to the fourth equals 0. 0 times negative 4 stays 0. So these guys cancel out. 6 over y to the fourth plus 8 over y to the fourth becomes 14 over y to the fourth and 7 halves plus 0 is 7 halves. Now how do you solve something like this? This is just a basic proportion, a fraction equal to a fraction. So the idea really is just to multiply through both sides by a common denominator. But that has the exact same effect as just cross multiplying. So really that's all we're doing is cross multiplying. 2 times 14 will be 28, and on the right side we'll get 7y to the fourth, Let's divide through by 7 to isolate that y to the fourth. 28 divided by 7 is 4. Now to finish solving for y, we need to undo that fourth power, so we're going to need a fourth root. And unfortunately, 4 is a perfect square, but not a perfect fourth. So we're going to have to leave it like that, and I also need a plus or minus symbol as well, because this is an even root that we're taking. So just like when you take square roots, you need plus or minus, same idea with 4th roots, 6th roots, 8th roots, and so forth. So here's what y is. We still need to find out what x is. So we're going to need to plug this in into one of our two original equations. Now, I think that this second equation looks a little bit simpler. It has fewer fractions, so I am going to substitute into there. Here's my equation initially, and when I go to substitute in, use what you know. Instead of plugging in what y is, 4th root of 4, and then raising that to the 4th, remember right here, we know what y to the 4th is. It's just 4, so I am going to substitute a 4 right there for that y to the fourth. And that's the same thing you would get if you had substituted in plus or minus fourth root of four. It's just a little bit simpler to see what this becomes. We get one over x squared, two fourths reduces to a one half. I'm gonna move that one half over to the other side so that I can make this equation look like a proportion again. And that way I can just do my nice little cross multiplying. So I get 2 on the left, and I get x squared on the right. And to finish solving for x, take a square root of both sides. You get that plus or minus symbol. And we get x is plus or minus root 2. One nice, easy way to show that solution is just to write plus or minus root 2 for the x, plus or minus 4th root of 4 for the y. And that's actually four different points. It's plus root 2 and plus 4th root of 4, or plus root 2 and minus 4th root of 4, or minus root 2 and plus 4th root of 4, or minus root 2 and minus 4th root of 4. So it's every possible combination of the different signs. Okay, next system here. This time we've got exponential expressions going on. We've got a 2 to the x plus a 2 to the y equals 10 and a 4 to the x plus a 4 to the y is equal to 68. 
So this one, elimination wouldn't really work because your bases don't match. You've got a base of 2 and a base of 4. So unfortunately, we can't just get those exponentials to cancel each other out, at least not initially, unless we're a little bit creative. You could try doing some kind of substitution, but that looks difficult to do because we've got 2 to the x and a 2 to the y. For example, both those x's and y's are up in those exponents. And the only way to bring them down so you could solve for them is probably going to involve some logarithms. So substitution looks kind of tricky to do as well. So here's where you want to get clever. We mentioned earlier that these bases are different. We've got 2's on the top equation and bases of 4 on the bottom equation. Is there a way to make these bases be the same? And the answer is yes, because 4 to the x can be rethought of as a 2 squared raised to the x. And 4 to the y could be thought of as 2 squared raised to the y. And if we do that, then using a power to a power, you multiply these powers together, this becomes 2 to the 2x plus 2 to the 2y is equal to 68. Now it's now a common base to what we have up here, but it's still a little bit different because the powers are not equal. So what we're going to need to do at this point is try something like substitution, but do it in a slightly different way. So here's what we're going to do, and this is something you probably wouldn't necessarily think of doing on your own the first time you do this problem. You kind of need to see it done first before you would get inspired to think of doing it. So if you're not, you know, very confident that you would ever think to do this, that's okay. You kind of have to see it done first before it would come to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this top equation, and I'm just going to solve it for um, 2 to the x plus 2 to the y is equal to 10. And what I'm going to do is just solve it for 2 to the x. So I'm going to subtract that 2 to the y over to the other side. And then what I'm going to do is over here, I'm going to think of this 2 to the 2x as 2 to the x quantity squared. I'm just reversing the position of this 2 and this x. It doesn't matter which way we do it because in the end result, they get multiplied together. And 2x is the same as x times 2. Now the reason I'm writing it this way is because I can take this 2 to the x that we see right here and replace it with 10 minus 2y. So this is how we're doing our substitution. We didn't physically solve for x here. That requires too much work. Instead, what I'm going to do is replace the 2 to the x with this expression 10 minus 2 to the y, and all of that still needs to get squared. So it's kind of a fancy way of doing substitution. And the reason I want to do that is because now this equation only has y's in it instead of x's. Now we're still going to have to do a little bit of work here to try and solve, but at least we're making progress because we've eliminated a variable. Now make sure over here on this quantity squared that you do FOIL. 10 squared becomes 100. In the middle, you're going to get, let's do a little scratch work here to see exactly what this becomes. You're going to get that 100, then you're going to get a minus 10 times 2 to the y, and then another minus 10 times 2 to the y. Notice I'm not making that 20 to the y. It's a coefficient of 10 times that exponential expression. And then we're going to get a 2 to the y times a 2 to the y. It's positive. And what's 2 to the y times 2 to the y? Same bases, what do you get to do with their exponents? You add them. So y plus y becomes 2y. And these two middle terms are like terms. If you have minus 10 apples and another minus 10 apples, that's going to be a minus 20 apples. So minus 20, 2 to the y in the middle. So when I FOIL, all of this becomes 100 minus 20 times 2 to the y, plus 2 to the 2y. Okay, now what we have are some like terms here and here. So we have a 100 
minus 20 times 2 to the y. Again, this is like an apple plus an apple, so you get two of these apples, so two of these 2 to the 2 y's. And then I also have the 68, which I can finally get involved by subtracting it over, and that's going to give me 32 minus 20 times 2 to the y plus 2 times 2 to the 2y equals 0. Now what you want to be thinking here is that this is going to kind of look like a trinomial. You've got your highest degree term over here, and I'm going to rewrite this in descending order. 2 to the 2y is our top term, and then our middle term is that minus 20 times 2 to the y, and then our constant is that 32. This 2, this 20, and this 32, they're all divisible by 2. So let's go ahead and divide everything by 2. So that's going to give me 2 to the 2y minus 10 times 2 to the y plus 16 equals 0. Now this is like a trinomial in that the middle term, the power on that middle term right here is exactly half of the power on this leading term. So that means that there's usually a good chance that you will be able to factor this in order to solve. So we're going to try reverse FOIL. What times what will give you 2 to the 2y? Well, you need a 2 to the y times a 2 to the y, so that when you multiply those bases and you add those powers, y plus y gives you that 2 to the y back. That's also good because that's what we want in our middle term. We want a 2 to the y for our middle term. Then over here we need two numbers that multiply to a positive 16 and add to a negative 10. So that could be an 8 and a 2, and if I make them both minus, then I'll get that minus 10 in the middle. So this does factor. All right, now that we have it factored, we're almost done. We just have to set each of these factors to 0. So if I set 2 to the y minus 8 equal to 0, I would want to add that 8 over to the other side, and I have to think about what this is going to be, so how could I solve this? You could maybe just look at it and see, because we know 2 cubed is 8, so you know that y is 3, but another possibility is you could also use some logarithms. And you could use log base 10, you could use log base e. On this particular one, I'm going to use a log base 2 on both sides, and I'll show you why. Take a log base 2 of the left side, and a log base 2 of the right side. Log base 2 of 2, this cancels out. That's why I'm using a log base 2. If the base of your log matches the base of your exponential, they cancel each other out, and we're just going to get that y. And then what is log base 2 of 8? Well, 2 raised to what power gives you 8? This reduces to a 3. So log base 2 of 8 is just 3. That's the power that you would need to raise 2 to to get that 8. So this factor gives me 3 for an answer. Let's try the next one. 2y, 2 to the y, minus 2 equals to 0. Set it equal to 2. And again, hopefully you could just see what the answer is here. What does the power need to be so that 2 to the y gives you back a 2? You would need that power y to be a 1. You could also take a log base 2 of both sides and you would get the same solution. All right, we're making progress. All that's left to do now that we know what y is, is to go back up to here and substitute these y values in to find out what x needs to be. So let's do the y equals 3 case. We're going to take 2 to the x equals 10 minus 2y, and we're going to substitute in a 3 for that y. 2 cubed is 8. 10 minus 8 gives you 2, and what does the power need to be so that 2 to the x gives you back a 2? x needs to be 1. So there's one answer. Let's now go plug in 1 for y. So 2 to the x is supposed to equal 10 minus 2 to the y, and we're going to substitute in a 1 for that y. 2 to the first is 2, 10 minus 2 is 8, what power do you need to take 2 and raise it to that power so it turns into an 8? You need a cube, so x needs to be cubed. So our two solutions, this one would have x being 1 and y being 3, or for the second one, x is 3 and y is 1. 
So that one was a little bit tricky. We had a lot of different ideas going on. We did sort of a unique way of substituting in to make our lives become a little bit easier. We had to do some foiling. We had to do some tricky kind of factoring. And then we had to think in terms of exponents and maybe even logarithms to try and figure out our final solutions. So that one was kind of hard. OK, next example. Solve the system y equals e to the x plus e to the negative x and y equals 5 minus x squared. So this one, you could try and do some elimination here and get rid of these y's, or you could also have the same effect and just think in terms of substitution. Since each one of these is set equal to y, the only way the top equation can equal y and the bottom equation can equal y is if these two things are equal to each other. We know the y's have to be equal, so these two right-hand sides have to be equal as well. In other words, we're just substituting in for this y on top what y is in this bottom equation. So by a, just a basic substitution, this y on top is going to get replaced by 5 minus x squared. And what is that y supposed to equal? e to the x plus e to the negative x. OK, so here's what we have. Now take a look at this equation. Ideally, we would like to be able to solve this algebraically, but this one's going to be too tough for us to do. And the reason I know that is because we are mixing together two different types of functions altogether. We're mixing together a polynomial on the left, that x squared, and then exponentials on the right. And typically, when you're dealing with two totally different types of functions, you're not going to be able to solve it algebraically unless you get lucky and it somehow factors very nicely or something special happens. And on this one, there doesn't look to be any kind of cancellation that's going to go on. There's no factoring that I can do, so we're pretty much stuck. So when this happens, when you're mixing together polynomials and exponentials or polynomials and logarithms or trigonometric functions and exponentials or whatever the case may be, usually you're going to have to resort to your calculator to actually solve the problem. So let's pull up the calculator and try it out. So your choice is here. You could either let y1 be the left side which was that 5 minus x squared, and let y2 be your right side, which was that e to the x plus e to the minus x, and then see where these two graphs intersect. And since I have it typed in that way, that's the way I'm going to show you. But your other alternative would be to set everything to 0 by subtracting, say, your e to the x's and stuff over to the left side, and then type in that entire left side into your y1 and find the zeros of that graph. So you have two options, either find intersection points or find zeros. Now, I'm going to go back to my standard window here to graph this. There's that parabola. And here's that exponential piece. So it looks like we have a very good window that we're looking at here. And I have a zero, excuse me, an intersection point over here on the right and an intersection point over here on the left. So let's go ahead and see if we can locate those using our calc command. So second, trace. And I'm going to do an intersect, which is option five. And let's find the one on the right first. So just arrow over to the right get it close to that intersection point and hit enter. And it should already be lined up on that second curve, so hit enter again and hit enter a third time for your guess. And so we get 1.188 for that x value and 3.587 for the y value. Now if you're doing this on a test, it's always a good idea to draw a sketch of your graphing window so that your instructor kind of knows where you're getting these values from. So this intersection point on the right was that 1.188 comma 
3.587 for the y. So let's go and see if we can find the intersection point on the left side. So I'm going to move my cursor. Whoops. Let's do second uh, trace first. Option 5 for intersect. And then let's move our cursor to the left over that intersection point. Hit enter three times. And it's very similar, very symmetric here. So negative 1.188 and 3.587. So this one over here, very similar. So those are our two solutions and we had to get just an approximation for them because of the mixture of the different types of polynomials that we were dealing with. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of word problems to finish off. Suppose that we have a rectangle that has an area of 180 square centimeters and a perimeter of 54 centimeters. What are its dimensions? So this is a very geometric problem. You definitely want to draw yourself a picture We're talking about a rectangle. It's going to have a length and a width. I'll just call this x and this y. It doesn't matter which one is which. And let's come up with what our system of equations is going to be based on the information given in the problem. We know that area of a excuse me, area of a rectangle is length times width. So this area would just be x times y. And what is that area supposed to be? 180 square centimeters. So our first equation is just x times y equals 180 and that comes from our area. Then we also know our perimeter and perimeter of a rectangle is two lengths plus two widths equals perimeter. So in this case that would be two x's plus two y's is equal to 54 and that's from our perimeter formula. So here is our system if you want, again this is optional, I like to look and notice that on this perimeter everything's divisible by 2. So when I see something like that I tend to always divide through by 2. This is going to give me a 27 and it just leaves you with a much easier function to work with. And this is also good because then this becomes very simple to solve for one of your variables. So for example if I solve for y I would just have to subtract x. And now I'm all set and ready to go for a simple substitution problem. We're going to take this 27 minus x and we're going to substitute it into that area formula. So this would become x times y or x times 27 minus x equals 180. And if I want to solve that, we want to distribute our x across. So 27x minus x squared. And I personally don't like leading off with a negative x squared, so I'm going to add that x squared over to the right side and subtract the 27x over to the right side, so I get a zero on the left side. And putting this in descending order, I get an x squared minus a 27x plus a 180. Now this is quadratic because of that x squared, and I already have my zero, so I'm going to try factoring. If factoring doesn't work, then we would have to break out that quadratic formula. And this one actually does factor. It may take you a little while to come up with the factors. and You might need your calculator to help you out. You're basically trying to come up with two numbers that you know multiply to 180 and at the same time will add to a 27. And it turns out that 15 times 12 is 180 and 15 plus 12 is 27. So if I make these both minus, then it's going to give me that right middle term. So you have to kind of come up with that 15 and 12, just doing a little bit of guessing and checking on your calculator, looking for various divisors of 180. And if that's just too challenging for you, then just use your quadratic formula, and that will give you the same exact solutions. So this solution is 15, this solution is 12. So if x is 15, then what would that imply y is? Well, we go back up here and we would substitute in 15. So 27 minus 15, that's 12. So x is 15, y is 12 is one answer. Or if I let x be 12 and plug that in up here, then 27 minus 12 also gives me that 15 back again. So no matter which way you do it, your dimensions are going to be 12 and 15.
So either 12 for the length and 15 for the width, or 15 for the length and 12 for the width. And I think we had some units here. We had centimeters, so my units here would be 12 centimeters by 15 centimeters. Okay? All right, last example. A rectangular piece of sheet metal with an area of 1,200 square inches is to be bent into a cylindrical length of stove pipe having a volume of 600 cubic inches. What are the dimensions of the sheet metal? So let's visualize what's going on here. We have this rectangular sheet of metal with an area of 1,200 square inches. So let's give it some dimensions here, our x and our y. Right away, you should know one of your equations in your system because the area of this rectangle is length times width, or x times y, and we're told that that area is supposed to be 1,200. So one of my equations has to be xy equals 1,200. Then what we're going to do is we're going to roll this sheet up and create a cylindrical stovepipe, something like that. And it has a volume of 600 cubic inches. So how do you find volume of a cylinder? Well, volume of a cylinder is the area of the base, which in this case is a circle. What's the area of a circle? Pi r squared times the height. It's the area of the base times the height. So here's my dimensions. I've got a radius of that circle on the bottom, and I've got a height going up. So volume of a cylinder is typically pi r squared h, and we know that that's supposed to be 600. Now the problem is we've got various letters going on. We've got x and y up here, and we've got r squared and h over here. So we need to make these match. There's got to be some kind of relationship between r and h and x and y. So think about this for a moment. If we roll up this rectangular sheet of metal, what's the height of our stovepipe going to be? it's going to be the same as our y, whatever height of our rectangle is. So this h is actually a y, okay? So we don't even need to have that variable created at all. We know that this height is just y. Now what about the radius? Obviously, this is not your radius of your circle. What is it? When you roll this up, this length down here wraps around the base of that stovepipe. And what's that called when you go around a circle like that? That's called circumference. So the circumference of that circle on the bottom is exactly this x length down here. Now what's the formula for circumference of a circle? And this is a formula I would expect you to know. Circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. So if 2 pi r is supposed to equal to x, what does just r equal? Well, we could divide by 2. So r is x over 2 pi. And so there's our relationship between the radius that we need in this formula and what the x was in the original rectangle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace in my volume formula this r with x over 2 pi. And that all needs to get squared, because this is your pi times your r squared times your height, and all of that needs to be 600. Well, let's clean this up a little bit. If I square this r, you square the top, so that becomes an x squared, and you square the bottom, so that becomes a 4 pi squared. And that one of these pi's could cancel, so this becomes an x squared and a y, over a 4 pi equals 600. So this is now our second equation in our system. So we've got our area restriction and we've got our volume restriction. So what can we do now here to try and solve this? There's again a couple of options you could do. You could solve this top equation fairly easily for either y or x and then do a little substitution. So that's the way I'm going to show you how to do it. There are other options as well. Because this second equation only has a single y, 
I am going to solve this top equation for y and make it 1200 divided by x. And that is now going to get substituted in to that y expression. So this volume restriction becomes x squared times y, which is 1200 over x, all over 4 pi equals to 600. So let's do a little bit of cleaning up here. First of all, one of these x's could cancel, so we're just going to get a 1200 and an x on top. And then I don't like having that 400 on the bottom, so let's multiply it over to the other side. So this becomes 1200x equals 2400 pi. And to finish solving for x, we could just divide by 1200. 1200 goes into 2400 two times, so x is 2 pi. And now that we know what x is, we can go back to our box and find out what y is. So y would have to be 1200 divided by whatever x was, which was 2 pi, and 2 goes into 1200, 600, the pi stays in the bottom. So there's my y. So our dimensions are going to be, the x was 2 pi, and our units here were inches, and our y was 600 over pi, also in inches. And it's best to just leave those pi's in there. Don't even bother getting a decimal. It's more exact to leave it in terms of pi. All right, that concludes our lecture on nonlinear equations. Good luck.